Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. It's still all like a dream to me. I think the more you accomplish, the more entitled you feel to your achievements. But at this point, I look back at where I was then and where I came from, and I'm just like, this is really cool. I want more. I want to be considered the best ever. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, that's good wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. My guest today is the GOAT among GOATs, one of the best to ever do it, Jordan Burroughs. Olympic gold medalist, four-time world champ, two-time NCAA champ for the University of Nebraska. He's one of the coolest cats you're ever going to meet. I really enjoyed this interview, folks. This was recorded at Jordan's in-laws' house. He was out in Buffalo, New York at his in-laws. And so there is a bit of background noise, but hey, when the king wants to record on the porch, we record on the porch. So I hope you enjoy it. Fan of the week goes to Chris Nader, representing Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you so much for tuning in, Chris. We appreciate it. Folks, if you want to see videos from the interview, go to Wrestling Changed My Life on Instagram. I also post a ton of videos on Twitter. It's Ryan underscore N underscore Warner. Last but not least, folks, this episode is brought to you by Assembly Fall, which is an audio documentary that we released last Tuesday on the biggest upset in Illinois high school wrestling history. Here's a trailer from it. Is this the biggest upset in Illinois history to you? Probably. I mean, that I can think of, yeah. So this would be the upset of the tournament. I think you could fairly say... To me, what an upset is, is somebody that beats somebody that not only are the odds against them, but probably shouldn't beat them. You know, somebody that if you wrestled 10, 15, 20, 100 times, they would win 99 or, you know, if, that to me is what defines an upset, is somebody that probably should never win, should never have won. Well, Matt Kukula has the attention of all those assembled at Assembly Hall because... He's trying to do something nobody's ever done in high school, and that's beat Eric Tannenbaum. I mean, it was so loud. Probably, I've never heard it louder than that moment. Oh, he's in trouble again. He's in trouble. He's in trouble. You can just feel the adrenaline go up. It was one of those iconic moments. Is it the biggest upset in Illinois history? No. In our minds, it's not an upset. So that's Assembly Fall. You can find it via episode 145 in the feed or text IHSA to 555 to listen. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for the King, Jordan Burroughs. Peace! Jordan Burroughs, the people's champ. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for the invitation, Ryan. Appreciate it. It is an honor. A lot of places we could start, but one of the things I really thought was cool was I found that after your sophomore year, you had gotten third. You were at your dad's house or where you grew up watching the Nationals on DVR. And you came mm -hmm. across an interview that Manning gave afterwards. And the reporter goes, what do you think of Jordan Burroughs? And he's like, oh, that guy, he's an animal. He's a winner. And that was the first time you started to think about yourself in that light of being a potentially a national champion. What do you yeah. remember from that? And how did it impact you going forward? Well, it showed me that those guys had taken vested interest in my abilities. Uh, I never... Excuse me, let me correct myself. I had been a leader, but for a very short period of time because I was never the best guy on my team. 
I wasn't a child prodigy. I didn't consider myself an exceptional athlete, but I was always a solid wrestler. I was always tough. I was always gritty. I could always scrap, but I wasn't physically developed as a young man. I wasn't really called upon to be in a leadership role or be vocal as, uh, you know, kind of the guy that people looked up to to get the job done. And so when I got to college for the first time, I remember after only being a single state champ, I won a single state title my senior year of high school. So I remember getting my, my Letterman jacket and I was super excited to bring it to Nebraska because I wanted to show it off. I didn't win it until my senior year. I was at my Letterman jacket and it kind of represented my home of South Jersey and everything that I had accomplished up until that point. So I remember going to freshman orientation that first week at Nebraska when I arrived in Lincoln. And I'm going around meeting everybody else on the team, shaking hands like, hey, Jordan Burroughs in New Jersey. I was a one-time state champ. And so as I'm meeting all the other freshmen, we had guys that were two-time, three-time. Even the guy that was a four-time state champ never lost a high school match. And so I remember after that freshman orientation and meeting all the guys, I went back to my dorm room. I took off my jacket. I folded it up, put it in a box, and never wore it again. Because I realized from that moment on, like, it didn't matter what I had done in the past. Every single guy on that Husker wrestling team was the best guy on their team, the best from their town, from their city, from their state, from their region of the country. And I really was going to have to do something to separate myself. So as my career started to progress, I had my struggles early on. But once I was starting to be relied on from a coaching perspective, I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. Just two years ago, I was battling to win a state title. And now here at a top five program like Nebraska, they're relying on me as the guy on the squad, as their leader. And that was pretty special. And once I knew that Manning believed in me, it made it a lot easier for me to commit and dedicate myself to going all out for him. When you can compete for a coach that you trust. There's nothing like it in the world. You do anything that guys tells you to do. And you want to win not only for yourself, but for him. When he was in my corner, it really gave me like an added uh, emphasis to compete at my best and to prove that all the work they had put in was uh, was the right stuff. Well, especially when you've told the story a number of times, your junior year, you got second in state, lost to Molinero. But just two years before that, you were out on the first night at districts. And like, I think your team was in a picture. You were wearing jeans because you were out of it. But, you know. Seriously, did you see that picture? I did see that picture. It's freaking ridiculous, dude. Because we won it. We won the team title. And so I got a jacket for that. I got a jacket for going 0-1 at the district tournament and being a part of the championship team. Because we had so many other hammers in our lineup that it really didn't matter that I didn't score any points. But I remember getting the jacket with the rest of the guys, and I never felt like it was warranted. It's like, I don't deserve this. I didn't earn this. I didn't really help. And I was that guy. Yeah, I was standing there in the photo smiling because I was excited for my squad to be a part of something bigger than myself. But also, I realized that I wasn't really a contributor. And so that was something that I struggled with for a while, too. Well, and then they, to your point, they took a chance on you because, you know, July 1, going into your senior year, you told the story, you know, a number of times. You, no, you didn't get a call. And yeah, then no calls. Like literally not a not a cricket, not a call, not even from like Rutgers or from Ryder, nothing. No, which is wild because now you see all these hotshot recruits and they have their, you know, graphic designer create this image for them. And it's like, <laughs> OK, here are my top five schools. I want to go to Ohio State, Oklahoma State, Nebraska, Michigan, Minnesota. And for me, I went on zero official visits during the fall of my senior year. So while everyone's picking all these places that they're going to go to and dang down five schools out of let's say 10 or 15 I had zero zero I didn't have a choice to narrow down to so I spent most of the fall that year just hanging out with my girlfriend my senior year of high school and figuring out what I was going to do once I graduated because I didn't think there was going to be any chance that I was going to wrestle in college I knew that I wanted to and I was second place in the state as a junior so I had the pedigree to do so but I couldn't afford it so I was like if I can't get a scholarship to college there's no way that I'm going to be able to compete at the best schools. Sure, I mean, I'll be able to walk on somewhere or potentially go to a relatively small school. You know what's interesting? The only school that was recruiting me that early on into my senior year was uh, VMI, Virginia Military Institute. They had a head coach named John Trudgeon. I remember he sent me an email, um, and my email was winslowwrestling at AOL.com. And I remember telling my coach, like, hey, this guy, John, he wants to come and see me. And he was like, uh, 
you know what? It might be a good opportunity for you. This might be something that you need to do. I know that you desire to go to a bigger school and you know have a hundred thousand people in the stands on Saturday afternoons for football games, but I think at this point, with your lack of recruitment, you are going to have to kind of think outside of the box and see what is available to you. He's like, I want you to take a visit down to VNI. It's different. It's a military academy. It's going to be much different than what your expectation may be for college. But I think that you have to understand when you leave there, you will have the opportunity to make a great living and to take care of your family. And I just remember thinking at the time, like, I don't want to go to a military institute. I remember looking online and seeing everyone on campus, all the cadets, like, dressed in uniforms. So I'm like, there's no way. There's no way. I can't do this. I don't want to go here. Um, but that was really the only school that was, was showing me any sort of interest that early in my career. If someone would have told you at that time, 13, 14 years from now, you'd have your own pair of wrestling shoes, what would you have said? Yeah, if I took a pair of my old John Smiths and wrote my name on them, in a, in a <laughs> that would probably be the only way I would have ever thought that I – I never thought about this. I never dreamed of this. I, but I just worked for it. Um, and I, I didn't necessarily work for this dream. I just worked for it whatever that next goal that lay ahead of me was. And I kept doing that repeatedly. And when I started consistently winning, I started to uh, desire to win more and do bigger things and to really cement myself in history as one of the greatest American wrestlers ever. But I didn't grow up expecting this because no one had done this from my area. My dad didn't wrestle. My parents didn't even play organized sports in high school. So, like, I grew up in a place where my dad really appreciated sports. He loved it. We used to watch the Eagles together on Sundays. Went to a couple Phillies games, a couple Flyers games when I was a kid. But that was pretty much the the extent of what we were doing then. Um, so I, I didn't know what it was like. The, the most I knew about wrestling was what I would see from my next-door neighbor's USA Wrestling Magazine subscription. Right, This before the Internet. You couldn't follow your favorite – athletes on social media when i got a i got my first pair of john smiths in 2000 and let's see what was i probably 2001 so i, I believe i was in seventh grade i won the middle school championships in south jersey and i got a pair of john smiths and i didn't even know who john smith was i just remember getting the, the smiths and the only reason that i got them was because they were the most expensive wrestling shoe available and so growing up i had a bunch of pairs of michael jordan shoes I had all these Jordans so I'm like okay Jordan was the best basketball player he had the most expensive shoe I don't know who this guy John Smith is but he must have been really good because he has a hundred and ten dollar shoe like up until that point no there was no wrestling shoe ever over a hundred dollars and this is when they made the new rule where you had to have your laces taped or you had to have a strap on your shoe and so this was kind of right on the precipice of that and so I remember seeing these John Smith Matt Wizard ones and I'm like damn these things are cool and their Adidas, which I'm I'm familiar with, right? Like, it, there's so much you don't really know as a kid. And Asics is dominant in wrestling, but you never walked down the street and saw a person with a pair of Asics on that were, like, stylish. But I watched all of my friends. I had a bunch of superstars and shell toes and Stan Smiths and Top Tens and all these Adidas that I grew up watching, Run DMC, My Adidas, and, you know, Aerosmith and all these guys. Like that was that was the culture that I grew up in. So when I saw a wrestling shoe that was made by Adidas and supposedly had this guy that was really good at wrestling on him, I was like, I want a pair of these. This is really cool. But I didn't even know who he was. I just thought he had really cool shoes. You know, and now fast forward to where I'm at now and I'm chasing, you know, his re record here uh, for USA Wrestling. It's, it's pretty incredible how my life has kind of unfolded. But it's still all like a dream to me. I think the more you accomplish, the more entitled you feel to your achievements. But at this point, I look back at where I was then and where I came from, and I'm just like, this is really cool. I want more. I want to be considered the best ever. But even if I don't, where I came from is insane. Like, if you look at John, John had Leroy. John had Pat. Yep. You know, he grew up in Oklahoma, like, where wrestling is really strong. Um, he grew up in a wrestling family. It was his pedigree and his lineage is so strong. But for me, it's like I wasn't even supposed to be here. And my life has been like a fairy tale. So I'm just enjoying, enjoying the ride. It's refreshing, though, for folks who didn't grow up with parents who were my mom was involved as much as she could be. But she was like a hippie in high school. She knew nothing about wrestling. She took me to the tournaments. Yeah. 
drop me off. That was it. But you see guys now were like Spencer Lee, one of my favorites, Rivignani, their dads were masters and they taught them everything and they trained with them every okay. day for all, over the all year. Okay. They're everywhere. Yeah. Like they, they like just the best pedigrees, Gable Steveson, but it's refreshing. to so, see someone like you where you, you didn't have that. And even you talk about your, once you got to Nebraska, just getting there was something. Even your wrestle off, you said you went zero and two and lost to this guy Casey or whoever in a wrestle off. Who? Casey Goobles, yeah. Who was it? Casey Goobles. Casey Goobles. He was, from, he was from Randolph, Nebraska. He was a like I think he was like a two time state champ in Nebraska. He was tough, but yeah. I mean, I, I didn't have a business losing to him. Let's put it that way. But like to that point, I mean, your your path is anything but linear. And you know, one of the things about the Adidas that I thought was super cool. Kobe was a big Adidas guy. I'd read that when yeah. he had passed away, you'd gone to his Instagram just to kind of reflect, and you're like, holy shit, Kobe follows me? I was, like, dumbfounded, bro. When I saw <laughs> that, I was, I immediately screenshot it. Not that, I don't know if anyone controls his media, social media account, but just in case it, it's, you know, posthumously, they start to take down, you know, the social media accounts of the deceased. I would love to always keep that memory um, because I'm the biggest Kobe Bryant fan ever. Like, and after his death, I, I don't, I don't like to be the guy who was like, well, I like him more than you. So let, let me show you why. And I, I just, there's a certain kind of access that I like to have to a particular individual that I keep within my own household. Um, and that sense of like secrecy, allowed me the contentment that I know that I was inspired by him. And it was, it was really special for me because I, I loved him so tremendously because of what he brought to the world that I never thought that I had enough to, you know, kind of allow him to admire me. I don't know. It was just really special. I, it was really special to me. And I was like, that was super cool. And so even though I never got a chance to, meet him formally or sit down and pick his brain it was it was pretty special to know that all the the long instagram captions that it took me you know hours to create all of the, the curated content all of the blogs all of these things for however long a period of time he was following me hopefully he read i, don't, I never saw like his name pop up in my likes, so i don't know if he liked it or if he just admired from afar or, you know but i gotta um, i gotta think that someone of his status and of his, uh, you know, kind of cognitive ability and how he perceived the world. He had to have been really selective with who he followed. And I think he only followed like 300 people. And so to be one of the 300 out of the millions of people that he knows is, uh, is, is sick. It's so cool. It's awesome. And it's basketball fan or not, how can you not be a fan of the Mamba mentality and, him getting up at 4.30 every morning and like the stories of him going down the hotel room floors and waking everybody up to work out, even if they were out the night before. It's like, who can't admire that? He was a he was an insane individual, but that's why he, he is who he is. And, you know, Lauren and I have been really thinking about this a lot with our son Beacon and our little girls as well. As, let's say, looking at Patrick Mahomes' contract yesterday, you know, the 10-year extension worth up to $500 million. How much of the workload that you place upon an individual at a young age is worthwhile? Is sacrificing parts of your childhood and the freedom and the innocence of being a young man or woman in this country worth the, the say, infinite access that you could potentially arrive at if you? become so exceptional at whatever it is that you do um so you know we're always thinking about that so like if our kids at some day are great at something how much of their lives are we willing to dedicate and commit to them perfecting their craft is that worth it and i think that kobe bryant was kind of that sort of individual at an older age in which he's like i am a basketball player my desire for my life is to be the most exceptional basketball player ever. In order to do that, I have to give up a lot of things that I love. 
for him to arrive at that place where he's a five-time NBA champion, NBA MVP, you know, top four, top three, top four in scoring, and inspired millions of people around the world. Was that worth it? I, I mean, I guess that's a question that only he can answer. Um, but it's hard to imagine that he would say no. I, I think it'd be impossible for him to say no. Someone who's that addicted and that obsessed. I mean, it's like, even if you get all the glory, you still get all the pain. And you mentioned a little bit ago, you put a lot of time into your social media and your blog posts. I just read the blog this morning that you wrote in October 2016. And man, that is, I don't know how long it's been since you re- read that. The one with Dear Wrestling, I think it is. Man, you, you put a quote in there that said you had felt like you were at the peak of your powers and then wrestling humbled you. I mean, obviously, that's one of the big turning points in your life outside of the knee injury, outside of winning in 2011 against Sargouche. But 2016, huge turning point. You talk about the difference of just the airport scene. 2012, they flee to L.A., you go on Jimmy Kimmel. 2016, you come home and the Nebraska airport is like deafening quiet. Awful. I mean, Awful. how much how much does that play into your training now? And what do you remember about sitting down to write that blog and just that whole experience? Well, the beauty is we're so close to Tokyo that I focus my attention on to winning another as opposed to losing the former. The difficulty though is that sting never goes away. There's a certain level of contentment that you have to operate with in life. You have to reckon with the fact that certain things will not be able to be reconciled. I think that we're always thinking with an optimistic point of view, whatever I lost in the past, I'll get back better. Whatever it was that I passed up on, something more exceptional, something better for me is going to arrive. I don't think that's always true. I think there's a certain mindset that you can have a certain level of peace and contentment in every circumstance, but that's a spirituality and less so of a circumstance. So for me, thinking about 2016 in particular, you know, it's easy to say, okay, it's, it, it's fine. You'll win another. But what if you don't win another? And there's never a moment in which you have the ability to have captured the world's attention at such a high level and have the, uh, the willingness to perform. And so I had to really reckon with the fact that there were a lot of things that I lost, a lot of opportunities that I lost on that day. You know, my chance to be a two-time Olympic champion at that point, you know, whether it was financial resources or, you know, the ability to have more followers and gain a larger platform and rub shoulders with dignitaries around the world and to be considered one of the greats, um, greatest athletes on the planet. I just one of the greatest wrestlers. I think that that was, that was a unique time for me. And, you know, it was, I failed. Uh, and that's something that I had to deal with. It, it, it's become easier. It was very hard at first to, to operate and to have a strong sense of identity and confidence within myself because I am a confident person, not naturally, but because of my success as a wrestler. I was a runt growing up. I was the youngest of four. I was a 103 pounder as a freshman in high school. Like wrestling is a, a relatively, you know, kind of taboo sport. We're considered misfits worldwide. And so I never was really particularly confident until I started to arrive at the peak of my abilities and realize what I was capable of. And when I became uh, the face of USA Wrestling, I instantly became an ambassador. I had to learn how to operate in different rooms. So naturally, I had to become a charismatic introvert. And that was difficult for me at times. But, you know, now, you know, you arrive in a place where it's like, okay, I got beat. I go back to the drawing board. I figure out what I did wrong. And I try to improve upon it the next time. It's, it's hard, man. It, it, it never gets any easier to deal with. But I think that the blessing for me is that I have the ability to not necessarily have vindication, but to try to do it again. You know, had that been it and that been all for me and I never had the opportunity to wrestle in another trials or to wrestle in another Olympic Games or World Championships, that would be difficult. You know, but coming back and that's what made 2017 so special for me was that 
many people thought I was done. That I would never win again. And I won the very next year, uh, which was really cool because that was, that was the time where I went through the most struggle internally. And psychologically, that's when I had the most battles inside where I was like, man, I, is it over? Is it over for me? And it took me a long time to get back to a place where I even wanted to get on a wrestling mat. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. I didn't want to see anyone in the wrestling community. I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to go into the wrestling room. I didn't want to train. And I was just like, I wanted to hide. It's like the Snickers commercials, right? It was like want to get away, or not? Not Snickers, the uh, Southwest commercials. And so for me, I was just I wanted to disappear. Like if I could have went somewhere completely alone that would have been ideal for me. But I had to make an instant morph back into from wrestler to father and to husband. And and that was that was a tough transition for me because there were people who come back when I can't got back to Lincoln, they're like, hey man, I watched you at the Olympics. And so when I when they say that, when they said that in twenty twelve it meant something completely differently. They're like, man, I watched you at the Olympics. That was amazing, absolutely incredible. But now I'm People will tell me that they watched me at the Olympics in 2016. I'm just like, shoot. Well, obviously they saw what I experienced. And that kind of comes with like this, this sense of inferiority. And that's, that's something that's been relatively hard to deal with. But, you know, it is what it is. You learn and you move on. And you hope that people accept you for who you are and not for what you do. And um, I got another chance to try to do it again. Amen. And thank God he wrote that blog because it captured your feelings at a super vulnerable time. And I don't think a lot of people would have done that. So that's out there. I encourage everyone to listen to it. And going back to the part about, you know, would Kobe do it again? It's like, well, would you do it again knowing you had to feel that low? And I'm sure you would say, yeah, you know, and because 2017 you brought the team title back too. that's huge. That was. That was the greatest day of my wrestling career. Like I literally didn't want to sleep. I remember Lauren after I won the championship and after every tournament, no matter what, win or lose, I always meet her right after the session's over. And I just remember winning the team title, watching Snyder beat Sajid Live to clinch it, having my belt strapped around my shoulder and walking outside to, to meet Lauren. And it was just such a special moment for me because I felt, so much redemption. I felt so powerful. Uh, and I didn't want to sleep because I knew the moment I went to sleep, it was over. Yeah. And then it would be, you know, the, how do, can I do it again? Um, so I stayed up as long as I could that night. I ended up going to bed like 6 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> but I, I, I literally didn't want to sleep. I just wanted to bask in it. I just wanted to, to feel that feeling forever. I wanted to pause and feel that moment for life. It was, it was a really, really cool day. It was awesome. We were all watching at home the, the whole tournament. And then obviously Snyder was, was huge. Do you think any of this happens 2011, 2012, any of it happens if you don't tear your knee as a senior in college? No, no question. Really? My life has been, it's a movie, bro. I'm telling you like, this is a legit <laughs> movie. You, and I'm not, I say that respectfully and humbly. But my life is a legit movie. I don't take credit for all I did was work hard. That's it. All I ever did was work as hard as I can. It, you know, people can say, yeah, that's really difficult to do. And you were really disciplined and you made the right decisions. But anyone can do that. I've seen a lot of people work hard and no one's ever heard of them. So it's not just hard work. It's, it's, it's like sometimes I feel like it's divine. Some of it's a lot of luck. It's just a great community and team of people around you. There's so many things. Uh, there's timing, but in twenty so in 2010 when I tore my LCL and PCL on my left knee, it was December. I got surgery in January. I was off the mat for about seven months. And I remember going back to the OTC that summer with Mark Manning, and I remember interestingly enough that was the first time I did any live wrestling, and. I was I finally got back on the mat and this was maybe July or August of that year. So a couple of things happened that year that, that made this really special. So number one, I hurt my knee, I was wrestling at 157. 
And so I decided instantly when I when I hurt my knee that I was going to go up to 165 the following year. I knew that's something that I wanted to do. I wanted to go up to 165 because up until then, if you're a 57 pounder, you're really a, a tweener between you know 66 kilos and 74 kilos. I was a little bit too big for 66, a little too small for 74. So I knew I wanted to go up to 165 so I could prepare for my freestyle career. Number two, Mark Manning went to the world championships as like an honorary coach in 2010. I believe they were in, in Moscow that year. He came back with a set of DVDs, 74 kilos. He said, Hey, you got to watch the world championships at this weight class where you're going to be wrestling next year. 74 kilos is a guy named Dennis Sargouche from Russia. Just won a second title in a row. This is going to be the guy that you have to beat if you hope to be a world champion. All right. So, and, and obviously a prelude to what would happen next, but, that's number two. Number three was in 2010, my fourth year, senior year before I got hurt, Brian Snyder was still an assistant coach at Arizona State. And so he hadn't come back yet to Nebraska. And so that year that I got hurt, I took that medical red shirt the season year at Arizona State. And then that following season, Manning convinced him to come back um, that summer. So he arrived there sometime June or July of 2010. And he was going to be there for my fifth year. My Snyder, he became my guy. Him and I connected. We trained together. He was my my training partner at my first three championships in 11, 12, and 13. Um, and so Brian Snyder got there. That was huge, instrumental, pivotal for me. Um, and then, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. Well, how about the there fact that more. you didn't even get the medical redshirt until your, your grandpa had passed away and you had to miss that duel? Otherwise, you wouldn't have got that redshirt. We even got it. That's the most bizarre thing to me. Cause I thought after your junior year, so you made it your so your sophomore year you get third, junior year you win, you're dominating. And then I from there you would think it'd be easy sailing right in the world championships where you said you said that your senior year you weren't wrestling that well. You had wrestled Justin Gagey. I think you'd smash your teeth up. And it was kind of like a, a weird beginning to the year. And you tear your knee and then you get a call from a friend that says, Hey, sorry about your grandpa. And you're like, What are you talking about? And you right. have to miss a duel with South Dakota State. Otherwise, you wouldn't have got the red shirt. That's freaking nuts. Crazy. So I defaulted out of the Vegas tournament when I hurt my teeth. And so I only got one match there. My very first match was against Gaethy. And so I missed the rest of that tournament, which would have been additional, probably another four matches. Missed those. Grandpa passed away in December. And so my parents were like, hey, we don't even – my parents didn't even tell you this. So – my parents want to be be so focused on my wrestling that when my grandpa passed, they didn't even tell me that he died because they knew that I was in the thick of my season. And so I remember my buddy, one of my best friends from high school, he was back in Jersey. He texted me. He was like, hey, sorry to hear about your grandpa. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, oh, you you haven't talked to your parents. So I instantly called my mom. And she was like, oh, yeah, he your grandpa passed away. I didn't want to tell you because I knew you had a duel coming up. And so I'm like, I want to be there for the funeral. They're like, no, you have to wrestle. You need to be at this match. And I'm like, no, I want to come. So they're like, okay. And so luckily they got my ticket and I flew down. So I missed the duel against South Dakota State. But I wrestled um, later on that week against Minnesota. And then the following week, December 19th, 2009, is where I tore my LCL and PCL against Steve Brown in Central Michigan. And, uh, yeah, that was the one match. I, I believe I was 7-1 at that point. And in order to qualify for medical retro, you need to be under 30% of your total matches for the entirety of the year. And I was one match under. And so within a two week period, I missed a duel for my grandpa's funeral and busted up my teeth and had to get an emergency root canal out in Vegas. And I had missed a bunch of matches there. So that was pretty wild. And then last, oh, that, that's why I want to remember. So last, I was supposed to finish out my wrestling career in 2010 which the NCAA championships were in Omaha that year. And, you know, going to school at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, we were the host, and we we're an hour from Omaha. So I'm like, oh, this is great. I get to be here and finish up my career in front of the home crowd. Uh, but getting hurt that year, missing, I remember helping set up the event and just kind of being there in the stands watching. But then the following year, in 2011, the NCAAs were in Philly. And my, I grew up 23, my hometown's 23 miles from Philly, right? And so I got the chance to be right in front of my fam. And then secondly, my wife, Lauren, 
her little brother wrestled at American. He was an NCAA qualifier in 2011 in Philly. And that's where she saw me for the first time. And she watched me. So her, I, I happened to be wrestling in front of the section of stands where her, her parents and her family were sitting. They're like, her dad's a big wrestling fan, wrestling coach, coached all of her brothers in high school. She's like, hey, you got to watch this bro's kid from Nebraska. This kid's pretty tough. And so she watched me. And not only did she think I was a great wrestler, she thought I was good looking. And so she sent me a Facebook, she sent me a Facebook friend request like the, re- the next day after the NCAA championships, only because I got a chance to wrestle a year later in Philly, see her. And it's just like wild. Like my whole life has been like, it's literally like crash, right? Like all these connections, all these degrees of separation from this happened, this caused this, the butterfly effect, this happened, this, this made this go. Um, and so that's why like, I try not to like operate with arrogance. The only thing I ever did was work hard and, you know, I'm, I'm just a blessed man. What can I say? I'm blessed and I'm thankful for that, for the platform I've been given. Well, the, the perspective you have is a beautiful thing. And like that, the first part of that year and a half, pretty turbulent. But then, you know, 2011, you win the national title, you go up to 165, you win the U.S. Open, you beat Howe, and then you get to the world championships, probably feeling good about yourself already. And then Sean Bunch comes up to you and he's like, yo, do you see the brackets? You're like, what do you mean? You're like, you got Sargu second round. And you're like, oh, shit. Everyone shook. When they saw my draw, they were like, well, there's in the burrows. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, yo, like, because I was confident. I, I knew at that point I was wrestling at a really high level. I could take anyone down in the world. There's not a person, there's not a man in the world that I can't take down. From that point, it was really difficult for me to kind of fathom myself being in this position where I have to wrestle the best wrestler in the world my second match. I'm like, at least let me get deep into the tournament. See, let me beat a couple of other guys, see what I can do here. So uh, it was a little bit difficult. When I, when I saw that draw, I had to really mentally focus and say, okay, let's see what I can do. Let's see what I have. Let's just throw it all out there. At that point, I knew I was a lot less skilled than these guys. I hadn't really wrestled much for freestyle. Never wrestled at Fargo. Couldn't turn on top. Really couldn't stop anyone from turning me on top. And so my first world championship, I got turned multiple times and I got zero turns and I was a world champion. All I, all I did was take guys down and push them out of bounds. That's what, something I knew I could do. I could wrestle that way. Uh, so, yeah, I remember seeing that draw. But the great thing about it was I drew. So, you know, when you, you take your draw, you draw a random number and it puts your placement in the bracket. I drew the number one. And so I thought that was really cool. And I remember when I, I talked to Zeke and he was like, what number did you get? And I told him I was like, number one. And he was like, oh, man, that's the same number I got when I won my first world championship. And so at that point, I'm like, damn, this is really cool. This is a good omen. But then a couple hours later, when I saw the draws come out, I'm like, shoot, that was not good luck. This is awful. Um, but I, re- I just remember wrestling Car- Sargush, and I knew what he was capable of. But I also went back that night, and I watched a bunch of his video. And so my coach was like, all right, watch his videos. So I sat down and watched a bunch of his matches, world championships, watching Russell Skidarzy and all these other guys. I wasn't really impressed. I knew that he was a great wrestler. He had the ability to control the pace of the match, really good two-on-one. He had a great single leg. He was a high percentage finisher, and he was just gritty. He was tough. He was mean. But he, he wasn't like this exceptional athlete. He wasn't this guy that was really fast or really strong or you know had great agility or good quickness. He was just a guy that if he could slow down the pace of the match, he could Control most of the guys that he wrestled, and a lot of the guys that he competed against were afraid. And so, I remember wrestling him, and I, I just felt great. I felt good, and it was it was a cool match for me because I remember after it was over, just feeling like, man, I beat the best guy in the world. Like, who else is there now at this point? I got to be able to be a world champion. But that was only my second match. I still had three more matches left. And so I remember my girlfriend at the time. After I beat Sargush, I had my cell phone with me. I was using it for my music and my headphones. And she sent me a message like, congratulations, you did it. You're a world champion. You're a world champion. This is awesome. And I was like, no, I, I beat the world champ. But I'm still, I still have three more matches. She thought because I beat the returning world champion, that made me world champion. <laughs> uh, but I just remember going back. And I was like going back into the back room. And I was just like physically drained. I'm like so emotionally overwhelmed from beating this guy and my arms are shot my legs are tired and I have my feet up 
we've got a massage therapist. He's like rubbing out my legs and man, he's on my left side, rubbing out my arms. Uh, Snyder's on my right side, rubbing out my arms. And these guys are getting me ready for my next match. And luckily I had a guy from Venezuela who was tough. Uh, Roberti, he was tough, but um, it was just a great, great tournament experience for me. And I remember winning and thinking if they couldn't beat me now at my very first try, then I'm going to be a dangerous man moving forward. Like I'm not just a flash in the pan because I, I, I knew that I was committed to getting better and I was only on the brink of what I could become. You know, I, I, I just, you know, like you said, a year and a half earlier, I was crutching around campus with a knee brace on. And, you know, I, it was, it was just a, a caddis, like it was, a meteoric rise for me and it was so cool to experience and be along for the ride and at the time it was before all the glitz and the glamour and the followers and the sponsorship deals and all that crazy stuff it was just it was so pure it was such a pure time for me and it was it was special man super special and that match against Sargouche is like if there was one match to get over the hill to be a world champ, he's pulling your singlet. He's nasty. I mean, like people love rooting against him whenever you'd scrap with him. How does he compare to wrestling another Russian, Sitikov? You've, you've been beating those guys down a long time, but how do you compare him versus Sitikov? You know, what's funny is my wife said that to me the other day. She was like, you know, the same way that Sargush felt about you when you first got onto the international scene. She was like, that Sitikov is you. Sitikov is Burroughs in 2011 to you. The guy, he comes in. It's a really close match. It's a back and forth battle every time, but you're the reigning champ and you're the guy that everyone expects to win and this guy beats you. Um, and he does it twice in a row. And so I think that for me, I'm hoping for that that 2014 redemption, right? When, when Sargush came back and he got the world championship and he disappeared. I think for him, he just he needed that one. He needed that one where he could say, I got this guy. And he could move on confidently with his life. And you know, he he was actually in the corner of Sidikoff this year at the World Championships. He was. He was Sargush cornered uh he was in the he was the back coach, he was the secondary coach for for Sidikoff this year at the World Championships in Kazakhstan. Um and so, you know, Sidikov has a, a very interesting style. He, same way, he, I wouldn't consider him a great athlete. But what he does is he commits to wrestling in a style for the entirety of a match. He knows where the strengths are. And he does a really good job at closing the gap. There's something that makes me uncomfortable from a wrestling perspective is when guys close the gap on me and control the ties. I like to wrestle from space. If a guy lets me tee off on him, they got no chance. Um, and so I think he does a really good job at that. And, you know, I think there's been two moments in which there has been a lapse in mental fortitude for me and they, and they caught me big, you know? And so there's no way you can look at the last two matchups between the two of us and say, man, this guy is, he's just a better wrestler. Heck I think no. for me, the hard part is I have to really focus on wrestling throughout the entirety of a match um and that's 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 ultimately what's going to get me in a place where i can beat him and beat him handily and so yeah it's it's you know i have a lot of respect for sitikov i appreciate him i respect him like there was genuine hate for sargush like i hated i hated sargush and maybe i need to hate that uh sitikov too because that that might give me a place in which i can operate from that matchup differently but it's uh you know russia is always going to be my biggest competition whenever i go into the world championships it's to me so now is a really unique case in you know in italy but you know it's it's always russia it's always russia and i wrestled those guys pretty much at every every championship i've ever competed in except 2013 i wrestled russia it's only a single championship in my entire career, and I've been to nine that I didn't wrestle rush, right? So in 11, Sargouche, 12, Sargouche, and 13, I, it was, um, 
golly, Kibetsi, he got beat by the Indian in the first round. And then I beat the Indian the next round, and he was out of the tournament. And then in 14, I lost to Sargush. 15, I beat Godoy of 16, lost to Godoy of 17. I beat Sabalov 18, 19, lost to Sitikov. And now, you know, it's probably going to be Sitikov again in 20. And so the craziest thing is out of these nine world championships, I've only ever wrestled a Russian in the finals one time. So I've been on the same side as Russia eight out of my nine world championships, which, you know, I had, I had a lot of disdain for UWW this year for allowing French and Miso to be the number one seed at our weight class. It's hard to say that anyone else but the returning world champion should be the number one seed. I think that if they haven't gotten beat, then they have earned that right. But particularly for me, you know, wrestling in, I wrestled in two tournaments that Shamiso was in last year, with three, including the world championship. But I wrestled at the Don Koloff in Bulgaria, where I beat him 9 2. And then again, we wrestled at the um, Yasar Dogu in Istanbul in July. And he, we both made it to the finals, but he forfeited to me in the finals. And he still, they still gave him number one seed. Not only did they give him number one seed, they gave him wrestler of the year, which I just, I, I was pissed. Let's put it that way. It's a flawed um, system. If you can do that, sit out, not be the defending world champ, be in the same tournament as another guy and still be the number one seed ahead of him. Seems like there's something wrong with the system. Especially considering that I beat him in the meddling round in 2018 and he didn't even medal with the 2018 world championships. Um, and he still somehow got number one seed, but. You know, what is that's a different conversation for another day. Yeah. But I think um I brought up Sitikov just because it's a guy who you don't there's not many people in the world that can take you to the fifth gear, as you've called it in a number of interviews. Imar seems to be getting close, you know, but there's like maybe two or three in the world that are on like the national teams that can take you to the fifth gear, and you're a guy who can go there into those into those deep waters. And sh- and drive there i mean that's where you've made a living over the years is those few instances where you've gone there yeah i agree um i don't want to have to go there <laughs> let's right. put it that way <laughs> ideally for me a match is not one in the final 10 seconds um and i i imagine i don't know how those guys are thinking but i think sitikoff will be okay with that no wrestler ever competes against me and thinks i'm gonna smash this guy never outmatched Everyone is, if you look at the tendencies of guys that wrestle me, they close the gap, they keep it close, and they try to sting me late. Um, they try to shut down my offense and have the ability to, whether it's putting me on the shot clock, getting close to the edge, forcing me out of the bounds. There's never a guy that comes out and fire. Um, that, that just rarely happens. But I also want to uh, figure out ways in which I can elevate my offense consistently throughout the entirety of a match. And that's what I was able to do as a young man. I knew that in order for me to beat the guys that I was competed against that were more skilled, I was going to have to take them to deep water, wear them down, and then my shots and attacks would start working late. Now that I've in, arrived in a place where I feel like my skills are on par, if not better than my opponents, I have been more efficient, but less aggressive. And that's come back to sting me a few times. Um, anytime it's a one-point match and a push-out beats you, you're going to be in a dangerous place. And so I think really elevating my offense to wrestle more consistently. And that's what I tried to do back at the Japan Am Championships in March this year, wrestling Franklin Gomez, the guy that I've had very close matches with in the past. This was the largest margin of victory that I've had in the three times that we competed against each other. And it was because I just kept beating down the door and staying consistent with my effort. And so skill-wise, I still have to improve. There's some tactics and some tendencies that I have to work on to adjust. But ultimately, I think, the biggest thing for me is is effort and willingness to to wrestle hard for the entire six. And are we going to get to see you out there before the trials next year? Any of these big pay per view um, matches? You know, I've I've gotten a few offers. I've gotten a few offers to wrestle a big pay per view match. Honestly, I'm enjoying my time with my family yep. this summer. Uh, in due time, I'll be back. We're excited for it, man. I greatly appreciate your time, JB. It's been an honor. One of the most requested guests of all time. I do have one one quick question from a fan. What's your favorite pair of Jordan Burroughs shoes? Ooh. I gotta say the ones. The ones the ones I have a love hate relationship with the ones. Because the ones are the least durable. I've had pairs that I've worn that have fallen apart on the very first wear. But 
they were also revolutionary. They were game changers. Like no one's ever had the confidence to make a gold shoe and people actually bought it. And not bought it from the perspective of like they spent their resources to get a pair, but I was completely justified in having a metallic gold shoe. And I could wear it and people would be like, that guy wears his own shoe because he's the best wrestler in the world and I'm okay with that. And so they were really special. I just remember sitting in the boardroom with at the ASIC headquarters in Irvine, California, like a month after the Olympic Games, and those guys saying, hey, JB, like we want to give you your own wrestling shoe. And so I grew up, I had a pair of Cejudos, I had a pair of Slays, I had a pair, you know, of John Smiths, I had a pair of Rulans, but I had my own shoe. I was going to be in the next line of great guys that had their own wrestling shoe. And so it's super cool to walk into a youth tournament or a wrestling camp that I'm teaching and see, you know, a fourth of the kids in the room that have JB elites on. It's really special, man. So yeah, it's been a blessing, and uh, it's 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 legacy. It's legacy. It's awesome, man. And it's cool they let you design some of the clothes too, like the single you wore last year. I understand you designed that. I did. I everyone wants to be an entrepreneur now, right? So I try to be aware of the climate and try not to just be a guy like, yeah, I'm a designer. I design clothes, but I do like to draw, and I have. I have my, my own sketchbook at home and when I get drawn inspiration from something that I've seen or wore, I'm like, this is cool. I want to make a singlet that looks like that. And so they've given me the autonomy to, to make what I want to wear. They're like, tell us what you want to wear. We'll help design it and you can make it look cool. And so we did the, we did the singlets last year at Beach Streets and then the singlets at um, the Final X. And that was really the first time we ever got to design our own singlet. And it was a hit. And, I, like, I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was really cool. And I, I bet more wrestlers will start, start doing it more often because it was, uh, it was cool, man. I think we all have a certain level of creativity. And everyone wants to look outdo their opponent in more than just the competition. And so that was fun. I had a good time doing that. It looked cool. And, man, it's, again, not many, not many pro athletes – are doing that you know so the fact that you get to have an input on your on your gear is even cooler man uh what, was it shark teeth on the side they were i drew i drew inspiration from like old fighter jets back in the u.s military um the u.s gotcha. air so yeah i wanted to make it like a almost like a bomber plane uh yeah with the shark teeth on the side and the military camo look and yeah, it was cool, man. It worked well, and uh, yeah, a lot of people liked it. Liked it looked it. good, and it got the d- job done as usual, man. It's been an honor. I can't wait to watch you again. Thank you for taking the time today, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate you, my man. All right, JB. Peace. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text Wrestle to five 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 eight eight eight. That's Wrestle to five 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 eight eight eight. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangedMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Come. 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 Take care, y'all.